you for staying with us. Now we move on and we're going to be looking at um, solving the import and export challenge. Many Nigerians have expressed outrage uh, over the decision by the federal government to allow Dangote Cement, BUA, and an unnamed gas company, well, BUA is another cement company, and an unnamed gas company to resume exports across the nation's land borders. The borders have been shut since August last year, and the belief is that it would curb smuggling, especially of uh, commodities like rice and tomatoes. We will look at this uh, closely this morning, and it's my pleasure to welcome to the studio Mr. Loki Amiwero, a member, reconstituted presidential task force on Nigeria customs reforms. Good morning. Thank you very much. And uh, two gentlemen will be joining us via Zoom, Mr. Joseph Atta, National Public Relations Officer, Nigeria Customs Service. Good morning. As well as Mr. Greg Obeifan, former president, Ship Owners Association of Nigeria. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Uh, let me start with the bird that we have in hand in the studio with us, Mr. Amiwero. Um, when this exemption was made by government, was any particular reason given? I don't think there's any particular, but let me try to correct one impression. Yes. We have three entry points, legal entry points. Okay. Seaport, airport, and the border stations. Mm -hmm. And those land end, borders. Land borders. Yes. They, are, they are local legal entry points. Uh, yeah. You know, those are entry points that are allowable when uh, cargoes can come in and go through the process. Most of the borders you have in Nigeria have scanners and all uh, infrastructure to actually assess clearance. And uh, for any restriction to be made, you must comply with Section 18 of the Custom and Excise Management Act, which is actually domicile, domicile in the office of the Minister of Finance. He regulates that. No other agency does that. We don't know how this one was regulated. Uh, it is not custom that we do it. And when we say there are legal entry points, that means it's for trading communities. Mm -hmm. You know that the one that happened last time, we've not been able to lay hands on the circular because it must comply with the law. And when we are talking about legal entry points, we have two types of trade within the border. We have uh, trade liberalization and uh, common external tariffs for third countries and originally, uh, originating cargoes from the other uh, neighboring countries, mm -hmm. which actually you have other people who are involved in trading. So, by the provision of section 42, subsection 1, 2, the, that constitution says you cannot discriminate against anybody in terms of trade and every other thing. So, and if you are going to give that preferential treatment, we don't know under what law, because you don't need to restrict anybody by the provisions of the constitution, section 42, subsection 1, B. It is very clear. Well, if it's legal entry point and there's going to be restriction by the provision of Section 18 of the Custom and Excise Management Act, the minister will issue directive, not central bank. Central bank is for monitoring policy. The minister is for fiscal policies. I think there has been a kind of confusion over central bank taking over the work of the ministry and all the rest. The provisions of the law is very clear. Fiscal policies are for the minister. He regulates... And restriction of cargo is not from the CG, it's from the minister. She regulates it. Is there any specific reason that you can adduce for the exemption given to these three organizations? Uh, government should do that. I mean, I mean, I'm just I mean, from your own, I mean, you are a member of the presidential task force on the Nigeria Customs Reform, so you probably have maybe an understanding that may not be popular. I think the whole thing has been either on uh, smuggling, on to develop our local industries on rice and some other things. And this thing can be done. If you look at America, America actually have an MOU with 81 countries in the world. 
We call those things mutual administrative assistance. Nigeria is a contracting party to that assistance. For instance, we're supposed to have gone into agreement with Togo, it's been a republic. We have three of that mutual administrative assistance. And that mutual as administrative assistance, that means the other countries will support you in terms of coming smuggling and oppressing anything that is going to come into your country. America have a MOU with 81 countries. So if you are trying to take care of your borders, America have done that. You don't see any of these countries closing their borders. What they have done, they are going to those agreements so that you can now, you know, uh, give assist the mutual assistance to other countries to assist you in trying to solve your problems in terms of smuggling and all the rest. That is what is done all over the world. It's a convention. Okay. And you have three conventions on that. All right, Mr. Atta, um, you are of the customs service, so perhaps there is a reason you can give to the people to understand the rationale for that decision? Okay, he's not ready. Okay, well, well Mr. Gregor Bayfun, I mean, you also operate in the same industry, and... Would you say this position of government is a way to go to resume import export you know in Nigeria, which of course I don't think it ever stopped at the seaports because we still imported fuel and a number of other things you know into the country but are these challenges also peculiar are, are they peculiar to land borders or you think that there are some other issues with the seaports as well that uh, people are not aware of um, thank you very much. I would like to uh, answer your question from a different perspective. Um, there were issues before the borders were closed. And there were reasons why the borders were closed. From a layman's perspective, the land borders were closed to curtail smuggling and other uh, improper activities. Um, after the borders were closed, the objectives for which they were closed, were they achieved? That's a question to ask. Now, there was a lot of excitement initially when the borders were closed. One, it was expected that it would stimulate in-country uh, development of the agricultural sector and make uh, the farmers have a stay in the, in the industry. Initially, that appeared to be the case. But today, you'll agree with me that the pain of border closure is felt when you go to the market to buy a bag of rice. That means that after closing the borders, there was no art well-articulated approach towards helping the farmers close the gap created by the uh, uh, goods that were no longer coming in by land. That's why uh, today the price increase will make it look like it's wise to open up the borders again and let these goods start to come in so that prices can come down. That is what the average person will say to you. But I want to seek your indulgence to take it a little bit outside this realm of discussion. Why is the issue of border uh, closing or opening more important than the fact that in this country, 100% of our exports, dry and liquid, are carried by foreign ships. We are in a country where over a million barrels of oil is exported daily, and all of these are carried by foreign ships. Now, if you look at the imports, we are a major importer of finished goods, about a hundred percent of the global trading ships that bring this are foreign. I think that for me, as a former president of the Ship Owners Association, that's where I think we need to be looking at. We're in a situation where we are concerned with youth unemployment. Now, before the demise of the Nigerian National Shipping Line in 1995, we had a very robust fleet that was trading globally. At a point, this country had 29 ships trading globally. So at least we participated in the carriage of, of, of our imports, particularly. Now, besides the economic benefit, look at the 
the huge employment opportunities that abound in that place, flying the national flag. And today, nothing, zero. For me, I think the emphasis right now is to see how we can begin to take ownership of the freighting of our imports and our exports before worrying too much about whether borders are open discretionally for certain companies or others. I'd like to stop there at the moment. Well, uh, Mr. Joseph Atta, uh, that conversation came to you earlier as to the rationale concerning, you know, well, rather the rationale for allowing just three organizations in Nigeria to resume, you know, at, you know, exports at the borders as opposed to so many others that most certainly are in the business of import and export in Nigeria. Any specific rationale for those exemptions? All right, well, he has uh, since mm -hmm. departed again. Yes. But, okay, well, Mr. Amiguero, one of the issues that a number of people are also bringing into this space is that of the AFCFTA agreement that Nigeria has signed and ratified for takeoff in the next less than two months from now. Do you think we are ready? Well, we are not ready. You see, I, I don't know if it has been sent to the National Assembly. If it has not gone to Assembly, then you have not rectified it. Because by the provisions of the Constitution, it must go to the National Assembly. It's not to be rectified by a minister. The provision of the Constitution is that those the, any convention, any uh, treaty, must go to the assembly for rectification. Or else it can never be law, local law. It must be domesticated. Rectification is not done in the presidency. Rectification is done at the National Assembly for it to be rectified by the uh, president finally. That is that. When you are looking at trade, trade in Nigeria is hampered by our procedures. Our procedures is bedeviled with lengthy and cumbersome nature. Thereby, we don't have the tools. And our import trade actually needs a lot of reform. I've written to the presidency, I think they are working in that, in that direction. If you look at our concession of our port, we are concessioning a port that we don't have a law. Our, our port are concession, they are not concession, they are leased. As at now, we don't have a concession law. So we have a mixed bag of system in our country. If you look at our procedure, we have a port that doesn't have scanners. And we entered into a, a, a contract as a contracting party to implement the Kyoto Convention and the FAL Convention and the SAFE Framework. And all those things have to do with trade facilitation, which is actually tied to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the FTA. All what you're talking about, the free trade agreement, is move, moving goods into a country. And if you look at Nigeria, for instance, we, we are disadvantaged. We don't have the tools to move our goods. We have a great lock that have taken us almost close to 12 years. We cannot move those things out of that place because of procedures. Custom and excise is three components. You are talking about custom is not the people. Custom is import and export. Excise is manufacturing. That means import, export, and manufacturing. You have four layers of the SEMA. SEMA is not custom document. SEMA is the economic document that is proclaimed by the president, regulated by the minister. Then you have direct are given by the board and implementation is done by the custom service. This three whole thing is that the pro what are the procedures we have in the port today? We don't have scanners. We don't have a procedure. Evaluation. In all the whole things. SEMA is a convention. We have more than 100 conventions in the SEMA. For everything you see there are conventions we have gone into for 1962, 1973, SEMA is not the normal document you see in the National Assembly. You don't just go and pass SEMA, National Assembly. SEMA is a convention you have rectified. 
domesticated in Nigerian law to bring, bring about uh, the operations in the economy. If you look at after the constitution, the next document that is more important in this country is SEMA. And SEMA is regulated by the minister, implemented by customs, directed by the board. And there is a provision in the, that, uh, that SEMA, under section 43, which gave the power of the board to nullify anything custom have done. The problem is we are having now, we are going into a system which we are not prepared for. What are our procedures in the port? I don't know the presidency, they replied. We are looking at all the, we have, we operate one of the most expensive ports in the world. Critically expensive. Expensive and uh, costly to cost, maintain. Cost and, and very lengthy and cumbersome procedure. And inefficient. Inefficient. Okay. All right. A port um, without a scanner. Mr. Atta, are you with us now? No, I, no, I, th I think. Mr. I think you may want to invite Mr. Tony Wabunike, who is the national president of our session of Nigerian Licensed Customs Agents. He has also just joined us uh, virtually. Maybe okay, Mr. You. Wabunike, um, I was going to ask about this Africa Trade Agreement, which we, well, which we are party to and which should take off any moment now. I'm sure that all the countries who signed this uh, agreement are looking to Nigeria because we have a huge population and therefore a huge market for their products and services. And they are looking forward to this whole business taking off. But Mr. Mwero here has just told us that we're not ready for it. So how is that going to work out when this thing takes off? When Nigeria, with the largest population in the uh, sub-Saharan region, is not ready to actually partake in an agreement to which it is a party. Okay, well, Mr. Wabunike, that was supposed to be for you, but uh, maybe you want to take that, you know, when we return from this break. So please stay with us. All right, we're back now. Um, so, uh, Mr. Tony, Wero, Tony Wabunike, a question was asked of you the other time. You want to take it to him? Again? Yes, uh, Mr. Wabunike. Uh, this uh, Africa trade agreement that's supposed to take off in about two months, um, Nigeria has a population of about 200 million. And I'm sure African countries are looking and are raring to go rearing to enter this huge market which we provide for their products and services. So what's going to happen when this thing takes off? Because Mr. Amiwero has told us here that we don't seem to be ready. How is it going to look when it takes off and the biggest market is not even prepared? Meanwhile, they have signed the agreement. Okay, let me start by saying that uh, Africa trade... Uh, uh, this thing is a problem for Nigerians because Nigeria is actually not ready like the uh, uh, If we are ready, why we should actually close the borders. We don't have any other international countries near out. The big problem to say that uh, after is going to take place and Nigeria is a big food market. So I think the federal government of Nigeria should rethink of reopening the border post to start with. All the while, uh, if I can just take you on that one question before we return to this after conversation. That exemption given, uh, Mr. Attack, can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Joseph Attack, can you hear me? Okay, well, he's not there. So, Mr. Ogbefo, we can haven't taken... Oh, you can... Mr. Joseph Atta, can, can you hear me? me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us now? Can you hear me, Mr. Joseph Atta? Uh, just please unmute the mic and leave it there. We can hear you if you just unmute the mic. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So that's yes, a very good morning to you all. Yes, thank you. 
So that exemption given to those companies, was there a rationale for making that exemption and not making it open-ended to so many other importers and exporters? Oh dear. Okay, well, we'll, we'll hope for that he'll be able to get that right. Let's go back to Mr. Gwefun. So, um, Mr. Gwefun, um, this Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, area agreement that Nigeria has signed and ratified, um, a couple of gentlemen that have spoken about it say, we are not ready. Now, if we are going to solve the import and export challenge in Nigeria, Given the population, the, the market size of Nigeria, as my colleague has mentioned, and given all of the things that we have to do, uh, given, given our huge dependence on importation as opposed to uh, being a producing country that exports, are we ready for after? Mr. Igwefun, that's for you. Okay, well, as technology. So perhaps, is, that, is it, we can't say we're not ready for technology, but then we're gonna have to employ technology when it comes to after. Now, you, you talked about um, a number of things, uh, you know, one of the things that you talked about is our processes, but then uh, a number of people have also talked about our producing capacity in order to be huge, a huge beneficiary as a nation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So if we are not ready, in what area are we not ready? You've talked about the processes. How about production? You see, production, when you look at what is production, production is all about building capacity for the domestic industries. Mm. And what are the, how do you build capacities? If you look at, you are, you are talking about light, we are talking about water. We are talking about fuel. When you look at the way you run your industry here, you spend more money running the industries here. So you go to Ghana, they have a 24 hours light. So that is a disadvantage. And when you are talking about free trade agreement, that means your country, Africa, is a global village. And the implication there is that we can move from Africa, from Nigeria to Ghana. From any, we have can move cargo. So when you see people like Man and other people, trying to, maybe they are, they are a little bit hamstrung in trying to support the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's as a result of infrastructures we have in the country. What is our life situation? You compare, look at the go and look at the impact between Ghana and Nigeria. The life situation, how many hours do light stay in Nigeria and how many hours do light stay in Ghana? That, you look at the cost. You run the cost, you look at that. And look at that and run it for one year. And you see what it costs a manufacturer to run for that one year. So when you run a, pro, a, a, a factory in Nigeria and you run that factory, the same product, you find it is cheaper from there to Nigeria. So when we say we are not ready, it is not political. It is not politicians to go and rectify. It's for us to be able to reform our system. Because, you see, it is not all about going to get revenue. It's all about to be, to be able to see how we can get investment, to attract foreign direct investment and try to build our capacity. That is what we are lacking. A lot of things, if you look at our infrastructures, we are lacking there. Where are the roads? Look at our ports. A clustered, but you have a grid lock for almost close to nine years. We have not been able to solve that problem. You go into the port, it costs you so much. So you have you, the, 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 three, the three components of trade facilitation, which is consistency, predictability, and transparency. It is not applied in this country. So well, we, we have a huge gap. It's not a political issue. It's a professional issue. It's an issue of experts to look at these things. We have a faulty procedure. We have infrastructure problem. If you're looking at going to a free trade agreement, where are your infrastructure? Where are your lights? Where are your roads? For instance, you want to push cargo from the port. You have an import. You are moving it from the port to Ikeja. When you move to go to Ghana, you, you, one, one day you've cleared, you take 30 days to clear from here. You take 40 days to clear here. So these are the issues where we say we're not ready. It is not sitting down in Abuja and we rectify. It's for us to go in and reform our system in anticipation 
of the, the, the expected. The expected is that we have to do two tools, two conventions, the African Free Trade and the, the uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement. Those two tools are talking about opening your borders within African sub-region and within the world. And are we ready? We are not ready. We, we are not going to be playing politics because these people will leave and the professionals will be there going through these problems. We need to look at our procedures. What is customs? Once customs signed the Kyoto Convention, the Kyoto Convention is about simplification and harmonization of procedures. Is customs doing that? And we haven't done that. No, we have not done that. We still have, we have strike force, we have this force, we have that force. And when people come in and see you, behaving like that. They will run away. They will not want to, they will start off. Because when you sign the, and rectify it, you make the, 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 the country, it, uh, people will have access to your, that is free trade. That means we come in, we trade together. Mm. And it's moving up personnel, moving up so many things. And you find out that this place will just be empty. So we must reform our system. Okay. We must reform it. Um. Do you foresee that the border will have to be opened? The border is legal entry point, for God's sake. The border is not uh, a smuggling center. It's a place where you have scanners, you have everything. Like I've told you, what is done in all over the world? Do you see anybody closing border in all over the world? It's just Nigerians don't go through systems. We cannot be operating a system of 1947, where you have a system of 2020. What you have, America have 81 uh, a mutual administrative activity. Nigeria signed with America. You cannot load any of their things here without uh, them being involved. But then there is the issue of uh, um, illegal. You, you no, you cannot call it. You see, the problem is that have we signed it? Have no, we no, 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 no. I, I'm just talking about an, another, you know, conversation right now because yes? you, you've talked about the legal you know entry point and yes. borders that you know customs people yes. are there and all of that but then there is also the need for conversations with border communities no you see you don't need the border communities what you need is mutual administrative assistance there are three conventions one on trans one on uh transborder crime one on suppression of customs investigation and right and the other one on custom matters there are three Okay. Which other countries are using? And what is what what that means that if, for instance, Benin Republic and Nigeria, we go into a, a mutual agreement, and the pro, once you go into that agreement, Benin Republic will be held. Benin Republic will be held responsible if there's so any you, problem. So you believe that we have to, we need to work on our customs procedures. You, you need to work on international customs procedures. Okay, well, Mr. Joseph Atta, you just heard that. Now you want to quickly respond to it if you can hear us. Yes, I can, I can hear I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Please yes. go ahead. Um, the question of uh, whether we are ready, the question of whether we are ready for ACTA or not, and whether uh, trade facilitation in line with the Kyoto Convention is being implemented or not, it's, uh, it's being approached uh, from one particular perspective which should not be. For instance, the Kyoto Convention places obligations on stakeholders too. It's not just about uh, customs. Customs is expected to facilitate trade, to ease the path of clearance and all that. But that will be dependent largely on uh, the readiness of stakeholders to be compliant. Uh, the facilitation is not for uncompliant trade. It's not for illegitimate trade. Uh, in a client, the stakeholders are like that. Uh, trade facilitation is made easy for the customs operatives to uh, uh, implement. Uh, having said that, let me quickly go to the reissue, which is that of uh, ACTA, uh, and whether we are ready. I think it's important to look at um, the threats that uh, uh, ACTA is uh, likely to bring. Uh, I know that the National Action Committee uh, which customs is oh dear. Right. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. it's gone mute again but uh, let, let's yeah. can you hear me? okay please go ahead can you hear me? yes, yes go ahead please okay I, I, I am aware that the uh, national action committee which, uh, by the way, we are, we are, we are actively represented the customs 
has a very uh, seasoned senior officer in that uh, uh, committee, uh, came up, you know, undertook a study and came up with seven uh, threats, uh, possible threats that the AFTA is likely to uh, come along with. And these threats include abuse of uh, rules of origin, uh, smuggling, loss of revenue, uh, negative impact on local production. Uh, of course, free movement of uh, goods and persons could uh, pertain uh, some uh, uh, threat to national security, uh, dumping, and uh, influx of uh, substandard goods. Uh, these are the seven threats that we are identified. Uh, I think what is important now is to come up with safeguards how do we deal with this threat? Because they say a problem well defined is half solved. Uh, is to come up with um, safeguards to deal with this seven threat. And uh, if we're able to do that, then we are good to go. But more importantly, I think whether we are ready or not, the answer should be a cautious yes. Because uh, some members of the, uh, or, 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 or some, some members, I mean, I mean uh, countries like uh, uh, Morocco and uh, uh, Egypt and other uh, countries have, have developed their production skills. And uh, if we did not uh, up our games, uh, they could just easily take advantage of our population and the market potentials that Nigeria holds. So what is important is to uh, take necessary actions to to to. to to up again, to be All right, Mr. Mr. Ata, just a moment. You, you talked about those safeguards, and I, I think it's important for us to even find out the safeguards that we had ab initio, were they effective? And um, what are the things that we need to do to ensure that they are effective? Because if they were effective, why would we need to close the borders? But we'll take all of that on when we come back from this break. It would hold at the Radisson Blue Hotel, 38 to 49 Isaac John Street, GRA, Kedja, Lagos, on the 15th and 16th of November. Attendance is both physical and virtual. Please note, COVID-19 protocol shall be duly observed. Itesi Wajweko, Ajumoshe Wani. All right, thanks for staying with us. Well, Mr. Atta, so to that question very quickly before we go to uh, Mr. Greyfoon. If the processes and procedures were okay and the safeguards were there all the while, how come we needed to close the borders to mitigate smuggling? Well, that, that, that was, that's, why, that's what I said earlier. You see, unfortunately, in Nigeria, we are quick to make references to other claims. Uh, and we fail to... Uh, ask ourselves whether our level of compliance, our level of adherence to the rules are as high as stakeholders of those same points. It takes two to tango. When we talk about implementation of Kyoto Convention, when we talk about enforcing the safeguards, it's, it, it's not about the security agent or the law enforcer alone. It's about the willingness of stakeholders, the willingness of other practitioners in the industry to generally comply with the rules. A situation we are... The reason that we have... Just a moment, Mr. Atta. The reason we have... The reason we have legal law enforcement officers... Just a moment, Mr. Atta. The reason we have law enforcement officers is because the law, the system, the nation anticipated that there would be people who would want to circumvent the process. Mm -hmm. Now that the customs is there to ensure that that does not happen or is not sustained, how come... Those safeguards were not effective enough to mitigate those issues that would arise. Okay, let's take a, let's take the example of the border closure you are making reference to. For instance, there are laws governing trans-border uh, uh, trade. There, are, there was also there is also an existing law which is, of course, should, supposed to be supposed to give us lessons guiding us as we advance towards after. That is the ETLS, the ECOWAS protocol on transit and all that. All these rules 
have been there. Customs have also been there, charged with the responsibility of enforcing these rules. But over a period of time, there have been deliberate attempts by stakeholders to frustrate efforts geared towards effective implementation of this. Sometimes even with the active connivance of our neighbors. And a lot of things have to be done. Engagement, strategic engagement at the level of customs administration within the region. And a number of other people, Mr. Atta, a, a number of other people would also say, a number of other people would also say sometimes with the connivance of some of your officers, but then I, I want to believe that there are internal systems in place to ensure that that is not sustained. But let me go to uh, Mr. Ogwefo. I tried to ask the other time, uh, but they, you know, now what kind of froze. What's your take on the level of our preparedness, Mr. Greg Ogwefo, for after, when it eventually takes off? Well, I think... Um the development of Nigeria accenting to the African Trade Agreement is a very, very good one. Um, it's a very positive step. It uh, obviously helps us to uh, be confronted with the challenges that are arising by the fact that we don't have the infrastructure to, at this time, effectively participate in that trade. So it just makes us realize that here is a huge market that we can economically and socio-economically benefit from, but we are not ready. I mean, you can imagine what it was like uh, in the days of National Line if right now we had 29 ships that would key into this opportunity who own the, uh, the continent. Okay, we, didn't have, we don't have it now, but we can start to do something. Now... There is an initiative which is very commendable. Now it's called the, uh, the Sea Link Trade Initiative, which is very, very aggressively driven by Nexim Bank and uh, a government agency, I think Nigerian Shippers Council. Now, what are they doing? They've come out to say, look, we don't have our own national. Uh, assets to participate in this trade, but we can syndicate assets. They have come to the ship owners associations and said, listen, there is an opportunity for trade here. If you have any ships, badges, whatsoever that can participate in any aspect of those, this trade, bring them in. Let's, let's uh, syndicate them in and see how we can uh, get into this business. I think we should see this as a great opportunity for us to revisit the idea of re-establishing our own national fleet, either okay. privately... Mr. Or Wifon, or I'm sorry, we've run completely out of time. I'm sorry, we've run yeah. completely out of time. Absolutely. Mr. Greg Ogwefun, former president, Shipowners Association of Nigeria, who joined us via Zoom, as well as Mr. Tony Wabunike, uh, National President, Association of Nigerian Licensed Customs Agents, ANLCA, as well as uh, Mr. Joseph Atta, National Public Relations Officer, Nigeria Customs Service, all three who joined us via Zoom, as well as Mr. Loki Amiwero, member, reconstituted Presidential Task Force on Nigeria Customs Reforms, who was with us in our studio in Lagos. Thank you very much to Thank all you. of you gentlemen Thank for you, coming to shed more light on this topic. And we hope that talking about this today will urge us on to get ourselves prepared for the taking off of the AFTA. <laughs> AFTA. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sunrise will return in just a moment with another interesting conversation. Do stay with us.